He has been working with a family of genes known as the HSP70 multi-gene family, including the heat stress proteins, the most highly conserved genes known in all of biology. His research constructing the phylogeny of these genes from different organisms has revealed deep evolutionary relationships between all living species. He maintains the blog Sandwalk, strolling with a skeptical biochemist, and has found himself the target of ire from the Discovery Institute and other proponents of intelligent design creationism for his spirited defense of evolutionary biology and scientific theories on the evolution of life. I know you'll already like him for that. Ladies and gentlemen, Dr. Larry Moran. Thank you, and I want to thank all the uh, organizers here in Ottawa for this uh, conference and for to CFI Canada for, uh, for for backing it. It's been a, it's been fun so far, and I'm really looking forward to not to the rest of the day tonight and tomorrow. Uh, I want to talk today about science versus idiot. Idiots is my word for intelligent design creationists. Um, uh, from uh, the perspective of what is the science, what do we actually know? Many of you here are not biologists or evolutionary, but how many of you are biochemists? Not too many. How many of you have taken biochemistry at some point? How many of you liked it? <laughs> um, so I want to go over, just give you some ammunition. Here's what we actually know. Here's what the intelligent design creationists deny that we know. And then just give you one example, just from last week, of the kinds of arg anti-evolution arguments that they that they use that that they employ to try and convince you that they're right and that we are wrong. And I just picked the one that popped up uh, last week just to give you a flavor for what's going on. So I actually teach a course uh, to students at the University of Toronto on um, critical thinking, uh, how to construct good arguments. And I use the evolution creation debate and discussion as a case study of how you should, should do this. And I tell my students, if you have to start off first, you have to define your terms. So I'm going to talk about why intelligent design creationism is bad science. Uh, and what do I mean by science? So then I have to define science. In my case, I use the broad definition of science. It's a way of knowing. It's a way of gathering knowledge. It's a way of arriving at, um, at universal truths. And it's based on evidence. You have to rely on evidence. It's based on some healthy skepticism. You don't believe in everything everyone tells you. Uh, it's based on rational thinking. Now, this is different than some other people. So in my case, science is not just the activities of chemists and biologists, etc. It's a, it's a universal way of knowing that everybody uses. That includes anthropologists, historians, uh, people who are involved in music theory or whatever. We all use this way of trying to arrive at, at knowledge. It, you, you need evidence, okay? Rationality is better than irrationality. Healthy skepticism means that you gotta be, uh, uh, you know, a little bit, uh, skeptical of claims that don't, aren't supported. This definition of mine differs from that of many others, including Jeannie, who, who have a somewhat more restricted version of science. And that's just another way of saying that the demarcation problem has not been solved. The demarcation problem is defining science and knowledge. The epistemology philosophers have not solved this problem. There is no one way of defining science. And this is important because it leads to differing of opinion sometimes about whether, for instance, intelligent design creationism is science or not. I have a broad definition, so I'm willing to concede that it is. Others have a narrow definition where there are limits and boundaries, and it falls outside those boundaries, so it's not science. So just be aware of the fact that there are differing opinions on this issue. So what do we know? What have we discovered using the scientific way of knowing? And now I'm going to concentrate largely on sort of traditional science. We know that the Earth is four and a half billion years old. This is not controversial. This is not open to debate. This is such a well-established scientific fact that you would really have to be an idiot, uh, you'd have to be silly <laughs> <laughs> not to accept it. Okay. What do we know? We know that fossils reveal the history of life. 
We've, we have fossil records now, um, uh, abundant fossils and transitional fossils collected over the last couple hundred years. There, there were earlier fossils, but there's been a big jump since then. <coughs> Um, and we know when these fossils were deposited. We can date the sediments. Lo and behold, we have an example of what the history of life looks like from the fossil record. Beginning two and a half billion years ago, we start to see tiny single-celled organisms in sedimentary rocks. Uh, after after Another billion or billion and a half years, these start to look a little more complicated by one and a half, two billion years ago, we're seeing things that look like primitive plants and algae. Uh, we start to see animal forms and shapes and tracks. Uh, 750 million years ago, 500 million years ago, we have what's called the Cambrian explosion. We get all kinds of different animal forms appearing in the fossil record. By that time, there are also lots of plants and fungi uh, available in the fossil record, and so on. So we have evidence that the history of life involves change from very simple organisms to what we see today, a modern, diverse range of uh, organisms and species. And in some cases, this is the, uh, um, the evidence from the fossil record of the evolution of whales from a um, land-dwelling uh, animal over a period of about 10 million years, 10, 12 million years or so, we've collected in the last 15 or 20 years fair numbers of transitional fossils showing this transition. This is the sort of stuff that you have to refute if you're attacking evolution. Okay, so this is what we're talking about, this critical thinking, critical analysis. This is, teachers are going to have to say, whoo, well, this is all wrong. Why is it wrong? Well, let's move on to something else, right? So this is, this is, this is what has to be attacked. What else do we know? Comparative anatomy, embryology yields classifications based on similarity. Back to Linnaeus in the 1700s. He noticed, as we all do every day, that we look a little bit more like chimpanzees than maple trees. Okay? So you cluster organizations based on morphological similarity. You look at the embryology, you say, oh, yes, we have the same uh, beginnings as uh, mice and, uh, uh, and dogs and horses, uh, so we're probably in the same kind of group. And so you can, here's a, an example of the plant kingdom. Um, where you cluster organism, organisms based on their morphological symmetry. This is kingdoms, phylums. Remember how many of you memorized this in class? Uh, this is basic classification. Now, from the time when classifications were first published, everybody suspected that there was some underlying relationship that gave rise to these classifications. But it wasn't until a little bit later on, when you started to look at the fossil record, that you realize that the fossil record shows that the classification scheme actually corresponds to the history of life. So here's a very simple example of the evolution of these various plant uh, groups, phyla, subphyla, uh, orders, etc. And you notice that early on in the history of life, you see very simple looking plants, non-vascular plants in the fossil record. Later on, around uh, three, 400 million years ago, you see things that look very much like primitive seed plants. After that, you see divergence of gymnosperms and angiosperms, the sort of flowers and, and pine trees uh, kinds of things. The fossil record then reflects that classification, giving rise to the idea that these things evolved over time. And the classifications we, we see today, our modern groupings, correspond to uh, the evolution of these groups over time. So there's no maple trees, unfortunately for Canadians. There are no maple trees 400 million years ago. In fact, there's nothing that we could really say is, is a flowering plant that long ago. Instead, we see much more primitive organizations then we see splitting into various groups and orders that are that are that are arise today. So this is, you know, you, you have to step back. This is powerful evidence 
that the organisms we see today did arise via a process of slow change, i.e. evolution. Now, in modern terms, we define evolution today as the change in the heritable characteristic for the population over time. What that means is that it's populations that evolve, not individuals. So over time, populations accumulate genetic change by a mutation, and some of those mutations, or alleles is the technical term, so these modified genes, some of them rise in frequency in the population, and some of them fall in frequency in the population, and over a lengthy period of time, the genetic composition of the population changes. That's what evolution is. That's how you define it. Okay? And it's a fact. I mean, this has been observed. One of the most famous ongoing examples is Richard Lenski's long-term evolution experiment. He's growing cultures of bacteria. Um, started about 1990, and there's up to 57,000 generations of these cultures of bacteria, and he's tracking all of the evolutionary changes that occurred in these one, two, three, these 10 different flasks of bacteria that are growing. And there are lots and lots of changes that have happened. So this is not controversial. This is evolution by definition. It happens. It's a fact. So if you're going to attack evolution, you have to start by agreeing that evolution is a fact, which puts you in a little bit of a difficult situation. Speciation, that's the formation of new populations, in progress has been observed and documented. This is a fact. There's even a couple of examples where we've actually achieved sort of reproductive uh, isolation. There are not many of them because we haven't been looking all that long. But again, not controversial. This happens. This is a scientific fact. One of my favorite examples of speciation in progress is, is very Canadian. It concerns the Canada goose. How many of you knew that there's more than one of them, right? <laughs> Yeah, if one's bad enough, uh, <laughs> there are actually several different varieties or races of Canada goose that are reproductively isolated. They can still interbreed if, if uh, conditions are right, but they don't. And so they're in the process. In this case, so sometimes they're even called separate species. So we're, we're, we're just so close to having these be different species that that classifications sometimes disagree on whether they are or not. This is not controversial. This is obvious. This is happening before our eyes. This is how new species form. Okay, This is evolution in action. And you can actually trace, you can do genetic analysis now and see which genes differ. And it's not a big deal. Modern evolutionary theory states that the main mechanisms of evolution are natural selection and something called random genetic drift. You're all familiar with natural selection, I'm sure. That's if an, a mutation arises that confers some selective advantage. It will occur, it will increase the fitness of the individual that carries it. Those people will have more reproductive success and eventually the mutation that conferred, that was beneficial, becomes more prevalent in the population over time. See how these all fit together into the, into the definition? Random genetic drift state simply says that this can also happen by accident. It doesn't have to be a selective advantage to an allele. Uh, they can rise and they can increase uh, simply by chance. Or even worse, a slightly detrimental allele that's actually bad for you can increase in the population. Can, uh, uh, an evolution can actually end up fixing or selecting for some bad mutations uh, as well. Anyway, these mechanisms are facts. They're proven facts. They happen. We can see them happening. We can document they're happening. We can sequence DNA uh, uh, you know, <laughs> easily. Undergraduates, even high school students might be doing it by now for all, for all I know. So all this stuff is in all the base. This is uh, Futuma's uh, evolution textbook. There are many other good evolution textbooks. They're all well covered in the textbook. So if you are an intelligent design creationist, and you want to argue against evolution, there's a whole book there that you've got to refute. And there's a whole modern evolutionary theory. You've got to say, okay, 
natural selection doesn't work, random genetic drift doesn't work. There's a whole bunch of stuff that you have to be able to deal with if you're really going to be a critical thinker. Now, mentioning natural selection, of course, brings up uh, Charles Darwin, who um, discovered natural selection, revealed it to the general public, said, this is one of the main mechanisms of evolution. This is how we get complex eyes and brains and, and, and flowering plants and pine cones and whatever. Uh, they conferred selective advantage on their ancestors, and then they, uh, they arose in the population. I think Darwin was the greatest scientist who ever lived. But note that he died in 1882. And that's a long time ago. Evolutionary biology has moved on since Charles Darwin. So much so that if we were to bring him here today and try to teach him everything we now know, including some of the things I just said, he'd pretty much have to go back to high school and he wouldn't even have time to learn something as simple as, or somewhat simple as population genetics before the world ends, which is only <laughs> four weeks from now. <laughs> um, so, yes, I admire Charles Darwin for what he did. I really do think he was a great scientist. I do not worship him. Neither does any other evolutionary biologist worship Charles Darwin. Why would I even mention this? Because the intelligent design creationists and creationists in general want you to think that we all bow down before the God of Charles Darwin just about every day and say prayers to him and that we're stuck back in the, in the 19th century thinking 19th century thoughts. That's one of the tricks that they use. To try. So if you can show that Darwin maybe wasn't quite as liberal as we are in 2012, maybe he had some racist tendencies or whatever, then of course that means evolution is wrong. Okay, that's the trick they use. Okay. But, you know, I say I am an admirer. We actually, I actually visited um, uh, Darwin's house, down house, uh, some, some years ago. Uh, I'm with a, a friend, so a guy I met on the airplane, uh, who wanted to sort of tag along and see what was what was going on. I can admire Darwin, and respect him, and think he's the greatest scientist without being a Darwinist. So I'm not a Darwinist. Modern evolution and evolutionary theory has moved way beyond that. Okay? So I reject the term Darwinist. So do most other people, but it'll come up frequently in the intelligent design creationist literature. What else do we know? We know that mutation is the ultimate source of variation in a population. Mutation, we know now, is a change in the sequence of DNA, so an alteration of your genes or of other factors in your genome that, that control gene expression. This is a scientific fact. Here's a white tiger, where the yellow hairs have all been replaced by white hairs, a known mutation. Okay. We know here's a famous Drosophila mutation called bithorax. Normal flies have just two wings. This mutation is actually a couple of mutations gives rise to flies with four wings. Okay. We know the genes. We know the DNA sequence. This is all old, old stuff. Okay. There's no question that mutations occur. There's no question that they cause variation. There's no question that some of those mutations are beneficial. Some are harmful. Some are neutral. These are, these are scientific facts. Uh, let, me, let me just teach you a little bit of biochemistry. It's, just, it's going to be, become important uh, later on. So this picture is of a DNA replication complex. These, the, the purple and blue things are proteins, and the, and the, um, the sort of strand running through it is mostly gray and red. That's DNA being replicated or being copied. Okay, so the enzymes are DNA polymerase, replosome complexes. Um, copy DNA. Every time your cells divide, you have to make a new copy of your genome. And the enzymes that do that are really, really good at what they do. But they make mistakes. One in 10 billion times, it makes a mistake. That's the source of mutation. The main source of mutation in biology just replication errors that happen randomly. 
and we know that they're random. Nobel Prize has already been awarded for that, thank you very much. So we don't have to contest that. We know what the overall error rate is. This is what biochemists do. So it's one in 10 billion nucleotides, we know that. So that means that every time your cells divide, every single time your cells divide, every time you make new uh, erythro erythroblasts, every time you make new skin cells, one error is introduced into your genome. We know that every newborn baby is, has about 130 new mutations that are not found in the parents. These are scientific facts. Okay. We know that this is true. Now we can sequence parents and children and count them. Okay. So this, this is not open for dispute. This is not controversial. This is, if you're, if you're going to engage in critical thinking, this is a slam dunk. As is everything else I've said. <laughs> so that means in the current human population, remember it's populations that evolve, 800 billion new mutations every generation. That's a heck of a lot of variation, right? That can be, that can then give rise to evolution. Some of those are, most of those are going to be lost. Some of them are going to be fixed. Some of them are going to be beneficial. Some of them not. But nothing mysterious going on here. What else do we know? We know that you can compare DNA sequences. Sequences of different species yield um, uh, classifications based on uh, sequence similarities. So you can actually say, okay, we look, our chimp, our DNA is most like chimps and a lot less like maple trees. And you can construct phylogenetic trees based on that sequence information. Gives rise to these kinds of things, which are all in the textbooks. Fact, students do it in the laboratory all the time these days. Uh, and lo and behold, these trees look just like the other trees, the ones based on morphology and the fossil record. The two uh, the trees are nested hierarchies, right? So they're, they're uh, 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 increasing branches giving rise to the common, uh, to the to everyday species that we see at the top of this tree. So the twin nested hierarchies, this is the argument that it is an amazing coincidence, isn't it, that the actual changes at the genetic level mimic exactly the changes that we see at the morphological level and the fossil record. This is the most powerful evidence that evolution explains the history of life that we have available today. And if you are going to say that evolution is wrong, you have to prove why this is wrong. Or you have to come up with an alternative explanation that accounts for the data. And let me give you a little hint. They haven't done that. Okay. Not even close. So taking together all these facts, observations, and inferences, they point overwhelmingly to the conclusion that life has evolved over three and a half billion years from relatively simple organisms to the vast array of species we see today. Just giving you a tiny hint of the evidence behind that conclusion. Solid facts. You would have to be an idiot to reject this scientific knowledge. You, 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 you really, you really would. Okay. Well, <laughs> intelligent design creationists pretty much do reject all that. They say it's possible to develop a scientific theory of design detection based on mathematics and information theory. That is, we can detect the handiwork of an intelligent designer. This is largely the work of Bill Dembski, and I think there are one or two other hangers-on who tried to do this, and we have in the audience Jeff Shallot, who amongst others has demonstrated that this is stupid. Okay, it just makes, it's no sense. Well, they're, he's, they're talking out of their other end. Uh, they say that lots of things inside the cell look like little molecular machines. Yeah, that's true. We actually use the metaphor molecular machines to discuss some of these little uh, uh, complex biochemical entities that, that do things, but it's a metaphor. Okay? We understand where they came from, but they say in their attack on evolution, natural processes can't possibly have produced these structures, therefore they must have been made by an intelligent designer. And we say, no, 
Here's five or six really good examples of these little molecular machines. Machines, uh, we have an evolutionary explanation supported by this and this data. Therefore, it's quite possible for evolution to produce these machines. Therefore, your whole argument goes out the window. 99%, as Jeannie said, of the idiot literature is a tax on evolution, a tax on the integrity of scientists, especially Darwin, and on the social implications of accepting science. You accept evolution, of course, that leads automatically to social Darwinism and eugenics. Right? I mean, all of you here do accept evolution, so I presume you're all in favor of eugenics. You're all social Darwinists. That's what the intelligent design community would have you, you believe. There is very little on their side, very little defense of intelligent design. As Jeannie says, it's all about attacks on evolution. All right, so let's look at one example. Let me show you what, what we're up against, okay? The kind of sophisticated attacks on evolution that are common in the intelligent design literature. This is not the NCSE site. This is the bad guys. This is Evolution News and Views. This is the site of the Discovery Institute in Seattle, the main propaganda uh, um, forum for promotion of intelligent design creationism. And when I decided I would take a snapshot of, the, uh, of their screen, I, I must admit I was, a, I was a little selective. I could have picked any number of articles that posted, but I thought this one was cute. How would we know if we were getting stupider? Um, and the answer is they don't. Um, but that's not what I want to talk about. I want to talk about this thing which appeared last week, your genome, which one? Now, this is just a simple example of the best they have to offer. This is the premier site for intelligent design creationism. People who write this are the leaders in intelligent design creationism. This is an example of their most sophisticated thinking. This is an example where they read a paper published recently in the paper, uh, analyzed the skin cells, different skin cells from the same individual. Picked a little bit of skin here, a little bit of skin here, a little bit of skin here, and now we, our technology is so sophisticated that we can sequence the entire DNA in those skin cells. And you know what they discovered? There are differences. Skin cells from your hand have, muta have slightly different genomes, slightly different DNA sequence than the skin cells from somewhere else. Okay, so not all of your cells have exactly the same DNA sequence. Hands up, those of you who are absolutely astonished by that, never suspected it was true. Okay. What do they say? Whoo, this is going to change everything. Here, I just have to, this is an exact quotation from the website. We've all been told that every cell in our body has a copy of our unique genetic code. That's one of those simplistic beliefs that sounds sensible. It's a simplistic belief, I'll grant them that. Okay. But it's almost impossible to check. No, it isn't. Doesn't the whole body arise from cell divisions of a single zygote with a unique genetic code? Yes, it does. Yes, but it doesn't necessarily follow that the genes in cells downstream don't get modified. That was just assumed. No, it wasn't. How many of you heard of cancer? <laughs> okay. Those are mutations that occur in your somatic cells, right? In, in your cells after you were a zygote. Okay. Apparently, they've never heard of it. There are immunoglobulin gene rearrangements and T-cell rearrangements and all kinds of things that we've known about for decades. We teach them in courses. Students, students routinely learn all this stuff. Mutations happen because of errors in DNA replication. As your cells divide and your skin cells divide, each one has a, a new mutation. Is it a shock that this skin cell has mutations or differences from this skin cell? No. The only person that is astonished by that are the idiots. This is what they mean by critical thinking and critical analysis. And I actually would love them to try to teach this in class. And we would get some high school student to stand up and say, wait a minute, this is stupid stuff. Okay? And then they go on. These are people who are supposed to be experts on evolution because they're attacking it. One thing is clear. The assumption that each individual has a unique genome has, has been overthrown. Okay. Wow, this new study. Just, just imagine, okay? Just think of how this might impact common evolutionary studies. For years, evolutions have been, evolutionists have said humans and chimpanzees have the same genome. But that just depends on which cells they pick. 
Okay, what if they actually are very actually the same genomes, but you just pick one cell from a chimp and a different cell from humans? It just accidentally happened to be different. So the percentage of differences is probably completely wrong. So evolutions are just, you know, completely probably completely wrong about all this. And of course, the profound implications are that. Uh, that uh, look at the bottom line here. Those of us in the evolutionary intelligent design community know what prevails at a given moment is not necessarily wise. In other words, they think that science has been overthrown by this study, when in fact all that's been overthrown is their stupidity. What they thought was right is wrong. Scientists knew better. Okay. So let me let me end there with this picture that was taken by one of my students in uh, in in Delhi. Uh, Yes, it's God they're talking about, but they're not even smart enough to understand what they're attacking. And that's why I call them idiots, and that's what you should understand. That the evidence, the, the evolution, what they're attacking is just so well-supported, well-understood, backed by evidence, backed by experiments, that it's, it's silly for them to think that they could actually make an impact in schools by teaching something opposite. If we teachers were well trained, we shouldn't actually fear their attempt to bring this kind of stupidity into the classroom because they'd be laughed right out of the classroom. I don't know if I have enough time for questions. <laughs> okay. Hi. Hi. Okay, uh, just as a quick question, what do the ID proponents think is happening as far as uh, okay, the uh, rise in antibiotic resistant microorganisms? Okay, well they're not um, they're not all stupid. Um, so some of them some of them will will argue that that's an example of microevolution, uh, and it, it, you know those kinds of things can happen in short periods of time, relatively recent history, but they can never be used to explain the history of life over millions of years. So this is all, you know, if you, of course, if you're a young Earth creationist, you will argue that this all happened since the flood. Um, that if you're, if you're a, uh, you know, old age creationist, um, you'll still argue that this, while this happens, it can't explain complex molecular machines. Evolving bacterial resistance is easy to imagine and understand, but how could you possibly get complex things evolving using that kind of mechanism? Yeah. Yeah, so you just brought up uh, microevolution. That's their favorite argument. Yes. Microevolution exists, yes. macroevolution doesn't. Yes. You know, what, what can we say about that? I, they just go on with this forever. Well, I, I don't know, okay? I, I'm, I'm, I'm actually astonished. I'm a, little, I'm a little puzzled about the lack of knowledge of many of the people on the other side. You know, I would have thought that they would at least have a few who could un understand the basics well enough to be able to say, okay, we, we get this, we're not going to dispute that, but here's our take on such and such. And there are one or two who do that, but most of them haven't even made the attempt to understand what they're attacking. And I, I just I just don't understand. I just, you know, none of us would ever do that. I mean, would you, would you stand up uh, or write a blog post about uh, quantum chromodynamics and why it's wrong? <laughs> you know, not unless you spend a lot of time yeah. understanding it. You, you kind of expect, at least I do, naively expect them to actually invest some time and effort understanding what it is they're attacking. And they don't. I, I don't know why. <laughs> they don't really need to do that. And I think that's the real problem here because religion yeah. is a fairly self-contained thing. And to, to, to think yourself out of a religious worldview into a scientific worldview yeah. is virtually impossible. Well, we under, you, you and I understand that, right? But as Jeannie explained, what they're now trying to do is they're trying to bring legislation based on the idea that they really do have legitimate scientific arguments to refute evolution. Yes, I understand that, but they're not even, they're, they are not even thinking scientifically. They're thinking within their own worldview, and within their own worldview, those, those limited arguments 
are thought to be convincing. And all they need to do within their own community is to establish that, well, for this community, yeah. this is nonsense. Yeah, what, what, what I'm saying is we don't need to be afraid of them. No, absolutely they, not. You know, I agree with that. We can take them on right. I mean, their science is stupid. Their science is bad science. It's not very difficult to explain that they're totally wrong. What I think, what I think we do need to be afa afraid of to a certain degree, though, isn't it, uh, is the cultural influence of the, of the religions. Well, let the chips fall where they may. Once we show that they're idiots, then we'll leave it up to their flock to, to say, uh-oh, what does that mean? The wonderful thing about idiots, though, is that they don't see anybody else outside yeah, of themselves. Others, others do. <laughs> yes, that's right. Thank you very much to Larry.